You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, we are live, but we do have to let it breathe just for a few seconds as we make sure we get five beautiful green check marks. And we are good to go. Welcome in, everybody, to the Gut Reaction podcast of Huddle Up here, presented as always by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, my partner in crime, my fellow football priest, here to help you exercise the demons. You know him, you love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, this is a pretty bleak feeling coming off this Week 10 loss. I mean, geez, I lost track. What's the score? I mean, Devontae Booker had as many points as the entire Denver Broncos offense. 37-12, the Broncos fall. And, uh, yeah, not a not a um, – auspicious beginning to their career playing in Vegas Raiders stuck it to him you know this this game and then I want your reaction if you guys can think back to remember Derek Carr's shining achievement that that 2016 season and then he got hurt at the end but he's playing at a MVP level the Broncos and Raiders first matchup of that season Zach this game is what it reminds me of that where you just walked into a buzzsaw and it never it just never ended but it's a bleak feeling right now. Broncos fans don't know which way is up. Oh, I mean, Drew Locke, bad. What's your gut reaction? Well, uh, for those of you who uh, tuned into last week's podcast, I told you if you play fantasy to start Devontae Booger, I hope you all listen to that because his revenge game was on point today. I want to just open this. We're going to be on here for about an hour, chat. We have a lot to go over. I'm going to be ranting a lot more than likely. But one thing I want to open with, I want to look you guys in the camera right now in the faces virtually and say – he was bad. Locke was terrible today. He was turn the page bad. He was indefensibly bad. There, there's no two ways about it. This is arguably the worst game that I've seen Locke play yet because there was nothing really uh, to make excuses for. The play calling wasn't great. It's never going to be great. But the decision making, the the accuracy issues, the footwork issues, uh, his offensive line was not good. The play calling was not good. Again, you can point to the injuries, but this was the worst game I've seen from Drew Locke. And I'm not ready. Some of you guys want his head on a spit. I'm not ready to go there just yet. I'm not saying I'm giving up on number three just yet, but he lost a lot of the win that was in my sales about Drew Locke's career arc with the Broncos. That was really, really bad today, and it starts with him. It was terrible. I want you guys to know that. I want to make that clear. Four interceptions, and really the backbreaker, let's be honest, the backbreaker was the turnover at the end of the second quarter when the Broncos are able to right there punch it in and if I'm not I'm trying to remember the score take the lead right if they get a touchdown there yeah they would have taken the lead it would have been 13 to 10 they would have probably taken the lead into halftime and the second half could have had a, an entirely different complexion but instead he throws a very ill-advised ball over the middle misses the safety and Jeff Heath has the best game of his career yes <laughs> i want to say it's it was crazy. uh <clears throat> i want to say it was Andrew Mason who tweeted this. I'll, I'll, I could go back and find it, but the Raiders had as many takeaways, all right, or t- uh, interceptions, excuse me, today as they had in the previous 11 games combined total. So it was just that kind of day for the Raiders where, you know, you look at Murphy's Law, Zach, where what could go wrong, <clears throat> excuse me, does go wrong. This was, that's how it was for the Broncos. For the Raiders, it was inverted. Anything that could go right, right. tended to go right. And Broncos fans right now, I mean, we're going live here immediately after the game, Zach. And just the last 45 minutes, my phone has been blowing up between DMs from fans and listeners uh, to emails to er – I mean, fans right now are extremely dejected because, you know, there's no silver lining to hang your hat on here with Drew Locke. There was no, well, he was bad in in quarters one, two, and three. But then, you know, he turned it on in the fourth. There was none of that today. I mean, it was just – erratic from beginning to end and I honestly as football priests we're going to do our best to help you exercise those demons and and help you start your week on as good of a foot as possible but Zach there's just nothing good to take away from this game take it from me as someone relatively familiar with the Cowboys if Jeff Heath has the game of his life against you that's a really ominous sign he's not Tyron Matthew but you never know that based on the way he played today and the Broncos made the Raiders in general look like world beaters look like a dynasty out there they're not that good they're the Raiders like Chad and I 
warned all of you they're going to be a lot better than many realize, but they're not that good. The Broncos played way down to the level of their potential like they usually do. And you mentioned, Chad, the, the things breaking right for, for I was going to say Oakland, for Vegas in this game. Good teams – they get the breaks. You know, the Patriots were always thought to be this lucky team who cheated, and yeah, they got caught up in some of that, but the breaks always went their way because they were always coached correctly. That's what good teams find a way to win and preserve victories. When Devontae Booker is having a massive two-touchdown game against you, what does that say? The Broncos were not competitive. The defense kind of held up, but there's a lot to nitpick there as well. The offense was unrecognizable. The special teams was brutal as they always are. I'm not to the point where I want to say blow it all up, but Chad, I mean, increasingly as the weeks go on, especially with this offense from the coaching on down, like you said, what could you hang your hat on? I want to throw my hat out the window, let alone hanging on something right now. What was so frustrating, and we talked about this in the podcast last week leading up to this game, is this Raiders defense, man, they were ripe for the for the taking. This is not a world-beating defense, but they were well-coached today. You know, they they executed – and when it's like a wounded animal, right? It's like a predator, a shark that can that can sense the blood in the water, and then they attack. It's a frenzy. You know, good teams that are well coached, when they sense that blood in the water, man, they attack. And the if 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 nothing else today, what the Raiders did is when they sense that uh, crack in the veneer, when they sense that blood in the water, man, they took their foot, they took their cleat, and stepped on the Broncos' throat. And I just want to grab one or two quick supers here, Zach, and then we will jump into we got a few matters of business we got to take care of and then we'll get right back into the stream here but mr castillo jumping in thank you my friend appreciate the super chat he says it would have been better for the broncos to have lost four of those last five games last year then they could have drafted justin herbert or tua zach your thoughts i i don't want to play revisionist history right now and i'm never going to root for the broncos to purposely lose or to go back and wish they would have lost more games it worked out the way it worked out they were, they were all in on drew lock for a reason and uh they built around him they did everything in their power mostly except for the right tackle after juan james opted out to help drew lock succeed except for i guess the coaching but it's on lock to take that next step and not only is he not taking steps forward He's taking them way backward, and he's taking, he's just kneeling back there, Chad. He's regressing in front of our very faces. And overall, I made this point on Twitter to some blowback. You can easily argue the Broncos overall have regressed from the Vance Joseph years. And when you think about that, it's unreal. The defense is better, but I, I getting blown out by the Raiders, being uncompetitive against the Falcons for the most part, these are not your grandfather's Broncos or even your dad's Broncos or your older brother's Broncos. This is an unrecognizable post-Bat Pat Bolin franchise that's wayward right now, and it seems like they're getting a lot worse before they get even incrementally better. That's maddening to me. What's adding insult to injury here is what did John Elway say at the end of last season, right? The Broncos – have bounced off the bottom. <clears throat> Excuse me. It feels like they bounced off the bottom, right? That they're trending on the upward. And then, of course, they make a fateful decision to fire their coordinator, who, if nothing else, for whatever Rich Scangarello might have lacked in 2019 as a first-year coordinator, he made up for in terms of his connection and development of Drew Locke. They made that decision. And of course, no one had a crystal ball. He couldn't foresee 2020 and a pandemic and all that stuff. And I think that's one of the biggest things Vic Fangio, regardless of how his tenure as, as head coach of the Denver Broncos shakes out, my bet is that that's going to be one decision he rues for the rest of his life. Smith Corona jumping in. Appreciate the super. <clears throat> he says, I blame Jawan James. Just kidding. But seriously, right now, Vic is proving he's just a defensive coordinator, not a head coach. Shermer is Shermer, and Locke's regression is just sad. Yeah, I mean, let's just put for a second here, Zach, Locks regression to the side just for a second, and then we'll grab matters of business here. Vic Fangio doesn't really seem to have a firm grip or grasp on this team. And his defenses, you know, in 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 their defense, his units have really tried to – they've been the bulwark completely staving off, like, abject disaster. But today you could tell about halfway through the third quarter, like, the, the dam just broke. They were like, look, if you guys can't help us – I mean, what was that statistic? The Raiders – had the ball for 13 basically of the 15 minutes in the third quarter. Mm. But nevertheless, as, as valiant of an effort as it's been for Vic Fangio's defense, overall big picture macro, you got the special teams costing this right. team big time again. You got Pat Shermer and the and Mike Shula together presiding over the regression of Drew Locke. And then as an offense, you, they can't get the ball going on the ground. 
I mean, they don't know what they're what they're doing. They don't know which way is up, just like the fan base. And that's a sad reflection of of really the state of this coaching staff. And Vic Fangio, I would guess in the near future, if this doesn't turn even slightly, there's going to be some sort of a sacrificial lamp. It's it, you know, you guys can disagree with me about the lock takes and all, but you guys for the most part are coming around to two things I've pointed out that Vic Fangio might not be the most well rounded head coach and he might not be deserving of being a head coach. And also the fact that Scangarello for this offense or for Drew Locke specifically was a better coordinator than Pat Shermer. The Broncos didn't just make a lateral move, they downgraded when they went from Scangarello uh to uh to Pat Shermer. But it's overall, I mean it's the entire team. But then you you look at who leads the entire team, who is in charge of the entire team, and you can laud uh, Fangio for his defense, and rightly so, but he's not just the defensive coordinator. He manages the entire team, and when he refuses to fire Tom McMahon, when the Broncos special teams are one of the worst I've ever seen, even worse than Brock Olivo, Fangio becomes complicit in that. It falls on him as well for keeping the coordinator around. When you have guys running into each other, on what is this, Chad? Monty Python? What is going on out there? So Fangio needs to step in and, and, and make things right, hold people accountable. He just won't do it. And that becomes a reflection on him after a while, and it has. Yeah, it's uh, it really is. And you think back to um, the Brock Olivo season, so what was that, 2017? Really, the thing that you scratched your head over that year was the fact that he kept going back to Isaiah McKenzie, who had six fumbled punts, right? Six muffed punts. I don't recall, and I could be wrong, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I don't remember special teams springing leaks every which way. You know, like each week it was something else. It was just always the punt returner. And I could be, you know, that could be, uh, you know, clouded retrospective view on my part, but it just seems like overall as a complete unit. The only thing this team has to hang its hat on special teams wise is Brandon McManus keeps coming through when his number is called Sam Martin's doing a good job as a punter. Okay. And then up until today, believe it or not, the Broncos return units, as far as their kick and punt returns were top 15 in terms of yardage. All right. There's no big touchdown yet or anything like that. In terms of average and yardage, they were up there, which is what made Deontay Spencer's foible on the, on the first kickoff of the, of the day, all the more frustrating because Tyree Cleveland had done a good job in his absence, and then he goes and makes that double reverse the field, you know, moment and uh, gets Drew Locke and company buried deep to open the game. My counter, though, to McKenzie, and this is what I want. I want to pose a question for Broncos country. What's he doing now in Buffalo? You know, what's Devontae Booker doing now in Vegas? What is the reason why these players who failed in Denver are doing better elsewhere? Drop me the answer in the comments. All right, guys, we still do have so much to get to in this game. We got to get to your questions. We got to get to your comments. A lot of super chats uh, stacked up, and I promise you we're going to get to them. But we also got to tip our cap as a matter of business to the sponsor of tonight's show, the support for this live stream pod brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. They obsess over their technology developments to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. And I know they just sent us out each the the nose trimmer, Zach, and you've had a chance to already use that bad boy. What was your experience? Listen, guys, we talked about the the, the lawnmower for the last couple podcasts when we've uh, talked about Manscaped, but something a little more practical, I feel like, a little more, you know, less taboo is the nose hair trimmer. I used it actually uh, earlier this afternoon, and it's very easily seamless. There was no pain. There was no grabbing. It it, it cleared me right out of my nose shot. Not to say a lot of hair in there, but it did its job very well. Uh, It's solid grip. It's it's um, water-resistant not just waterproof. So you can take it in the shower. You can take it with you. It works really well. I'm very, very much a fan of this nose hair trimmer. Every guy has had some kind of a bad experience trying to keep things trimmed up. All right. I don't want to get, I don't want to get too gross here because I know there are a lot of ladies in our audience as well, but that's why Manscaped redesigned their electric trimmer. The engineering team spent 18 months perfecting the greatest trimmer ever created for below the waist and just released the new and improved lawnmower 3.0. It's their third generation trimmer featuring a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to advanced skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped. And when we tell you that this is premium, we mean premium because the battery not only lasts up to 90 minutes, you can take a longer shave, but it also has waterproof technology so you can do it in the shower 
And also one of the coolest features is, I'm just going to turn this on. It doesn't make for great audio on a podcast, but I just want to show you. You also get the light, the LED light, which illuminates, gives you better accuracy for closer, more precise trimming. The motor, 7,000 RPMs. And let's not forget, it also comes with a charging stand. All right, so you can show off your more loud and proud because this intelligently designed stand is a convenient charging dock powered by USB. So if you're listening to us right now, we want you to experience this firsthand yourself. Trim up that junk of yours. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code HUDDLE at manscaped.com. And this is also a good gift idea for the ladies in our community right now that are trying to think of something to get for the hubby or the significant other or that teenager or that kid that's off to college. It would make a great gift. Yeah, guys, Broncos Country, listen up. Once again, get 20% off and free shipping with the code HUDDLE at manscaped.com. Once again, that's 20% off with free shipping, guys, at manscaped.com. Don't forget to use the code HUDDLE. I promise you guys will not regret it. We do appreciate them for sponsoring the podcast. And one thing that we love about our community, Zach, is our audience, our community supports the advertising partners that support this podcast, and we really appreciate yeah. that. Uh, John, one real quick, and then we'll grab Naj. I just want to remind everyone really quick, follow the pod on Twitter, at Huddle Up Pod, also at Mile High Huddle, okay? Also, brief, uh, very gentle reminder here to make sure if you get some time, head on over to HuddleUpPod.com, get your swag on, get a hack, get a T-shirt, get a little something. And then the last thing is if you're not in a position to do any of those things, it's all good. Just make sure you're subscribed, like this video, and if you think Zach and I are doing a good job for you, come you know, hell or high water, rain, sleet, snow, we're here for you day in, day out. If you think we're doing a good job, share this video out there. That's the best testimonial for the Huddle Up podcast. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Coors Hard Seltzer is not your average seltzer. Rooted in Coors' long history of sustainability is a brand inspired by a generation that wants to do good in the world with a mission to restore America's rivers Never before has it been so easy as an American to make a difference in the world. Coors Heart Seltzer is launching the world's easiest volunteer program. Whatever you're doing, by simply cracking open a can of Coors Heart Seltzer, you are volunteering. Here's the truth, gang. Our waterways are at risk. 80% of America's rivers are drying up. But through a partnership with Change the Course, Coors Heart Seltzer is helping to protect and restore America's rivers. Each 12-pack of Coors Hard Seltzer restores 500 gallons of fresh water to U.S. rivers and the communities that depend on them. The results? One billion, that's with a B, gang, gallons of water restored to 16 river basins across the U.S., including the Colorado River. And that's just year one. Four refreshing flavors, one cool cause. You got to get out there and enjoy the naturally flavored black cherry, mango, lemon lime, and grapefruit. And the specs are in. Coors Hard Seltzer is 4.5% ABV, and it's only 90 calories, Zach. Man, Broncos country. Watching Drew Locke was a struggle in that game, but what got me through it was definitely my Coors Hard Seltzer. Guys, even in times where the Broncos are bad, Coors Hard Seltzer is always good, good, good. That's right, gang. So join the world's easiest volunteer program. By simply drinking Coors Hard Seltzer, you can volunteer to restore America's rivers. You buy Coors Hard Seltzer, you help restore 500 gallons of water into America's rivers. It's that simple. Never before has it been so easy and so enjoyable to make a difference in the world. So visit CoorsSeltzer.com to find a Coors Hard Seltzer near you. That's CoorsSeltzer.com. For every 12-pack sold through 831-2021, Coors will purchase services from Change the Course to restore 500 gallons of fresh river water. Details at CoorsSeltzer.com. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. All right, John, let's get Naj up there. Let's see what's on his mind. Appreciate the super, my friend, a bona fide superstar. Really appreciate your support. He says, boy, was I wrong on Locke. Coaching, terrible. Locke, terrible. Defense, uninspired. Special teams, useless. Week after week, Fangio is outclassed by the coach on the other side. I don't see them winning another game. Awful. Zach, if they play like this week in and week out, they're not going to win another game. I mean, there's literally nobody, including Carolina, left on their schedule that they can Fair. beat if they play like this. If they th- turn it over, what 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 did it end up? Five turnovers, four picks on from Locke, including one in the red zone, one in the end zone, in fact. The fumble by Deshaun Hamilton, that's five turnovers. I don't care who you are. 
you're not going to survive that. And that's what made week four, like as much as we tipped our cap to Brett Rippon for a heroic performance of coming in as the third guy on the depth chart and starting and bringing home that first dub for the Broncos of the season in week four against the Jets. A, it was the Jets. And B, Zach, they overcame, what were they, minus three, I want to say, in turnover mm-hmm. differential. It's so rare that you overcome that. I mean, it takes a real um, just twist of fate from the football gods to overcome that kind of deficit. So, Zach, I, I agree with Naj. If they play like this, it's hard to see another win on the schedule in 2020. I feel like that should have been a warning sign, though. If they had a struggle to beat the Jets in prime time, what does that say about the Broncos, even without Drew Locke? Naj, I agree with every one of your points that you made, though I I think they will find a way to sneak a couple more victories, if only to ruin their draft position and kind of screw themselves out of a top-flight prospect. But um, there's nothing really to take away that's positive, maybe except for the play of Bryce Callahan from this game and, and from the season overall. It's been uh, uh, way less than we thought it was going to be, to put it very bluntly. Jess jumping in, dedicated Super Chat superstar. Thank you for the support, my friend. He says, I don't want to see this team wear the Bronco logo. I mean, it's – look, I get it. It's bad. It's ugly. But, guys, I just want you to take your finger off the the panic button a little bit because I'm not telling you, hey, man, this team still has a chance. You should expect them, you know, to turn the ship around in 2020. We can face the facts sitting at three and six. You know, this season is lost, all right? And and they lost that basically last week was their, their last chance to really put their foot in the ground and pivot to make a play in terms of overcoming all their injury foibles and all the problems they've had. That was their chance, and they blew it. Today only intensified that. But, gang, they're, you know, this too shall pass, all right? 2020 has been a crappy year all around. The Broncos have been really dinged by the injury bug. It makes it all the harder for uh, uh, John Elway and Joe Ellis to try and really figure out what they have. But, you know, the coaches haven't done them any favors. The players haven't helped the coaches when the chips are down. But this too shall pass. What I'm trying to say is 2020 will come and go. We're going to be here throughout the entire process for you guys. But you know what? Another football season is around the corner, and there's still now, Zach, seven games left to be played. You know, I would say that, okay, maybe the Broncos, it's not going to be a playoff year. We can all turn the page to it being a developmental year, looking toward 2021. And I can maybe get on the boat and uh, preach positivity and optimism by saying the Broncos are getting a good look at their younger players. But here's my counter to that. Where was Michael Ojemudia today? Why was a Sang Bassey left out there when he was clearly overmatched when you have your uh, top flight cornerback who's been playing really well as a rookie and he was nowhere to be found? So again, I can even try to preach positivity about the younger players and what to look forward to. But when you have this coaching staff hampering everyone and being an albatross for everyone, it's really hard to be anything but cynical going forward. Uh, Jonathan, jumping in. Appreciate the super chat, my friend. You are another guy that's really come on strong lately, and we appreciate your support. He says, four picks. Can't uh, excuse me. Can't put all of that on Shermer and give all the credit to Drew when he does well. Drew has to take this one, and I agree. Like, if you're, if you, there's no. I think the thumbnail on this live stream on YouTube and Facebook, the thumbnail says something like, "No defense. You can't defend Drew Lock today." You can point to the running game's inability to get anything going. You can point to the pressure. But really, this boils down to luck. Zach, what was the last thing you said on our rapid reaction halftime stream as far as the second half? It was something to the effect of, all right, this isn't verbatim, but you said something. It's all about Drew. It's all about number three in the second half. If number three can elevate and play better, then this team has a chance. He didn't. And four picks, I mean, dude, six, let's see, six passing touchdowns. Now 10 interceptions on the season, plus two rushing. It's just bad numbers. And unfortunately, just the the vibe and the energy that you got uh, from this team today, Zach, it just it's hard to see that changing in the near future, especially as this schedule, it's not lightening up. I mean, next week, it's the Dolphins. And yes, the Dolphins with a rookie quarterback, but they're playing really well. And Tua, you know, he's popping. All, he, last week and this week, he's played really, really well. But what do we always say about uh, the Broncos or any other team? They go as the quarterback goes. So I wanted to see how Locke would bounce back. He's mostly been a second-half quarterback, and he got you – know, this was a the worst second half I've ever seen of Drew Locke. And here's what's so concerning to me. they weren't The interceptions weren't just bad throws. They were horrible decisions. Yeah. And that's that's what you want to kind of coach out of him. And that's not to me on Pat Shermer. I've been the harshest Shermer critic, but I looked at you guys in the in the face today 
opening up and said this was on Drew Locke. He's the reason they lost today's game. He just seems like he's taking steps backward in front of our very face. His footwork, his inaccuracy, that's one thing. But when he's making those decisions, like on a, a last chance throw into the end zone, when your back's against the wall, you're throwing in a tri- triple coverage. You're throwing hospital balls out there. You know, college quarterbacks have more foresight than that. So that makes you wonder how much, you know, he really has up here, you know? I want to grab Christian here, but just real quick to to riff off what you just said. What kept jumping out to me in this game in particular, and this has been a, a thematic over the last quarter of the season from Drew Locke, is he doesn't seem to either A, recognize what he's seeing in coverage once the ball is snapped, or he doesn't trust what he's seeing. And so the ball always comes out a half beat, sometimes more, late. And that's what leads to the hospital balls, and that's what leads, obviously, to a lot of the interceptions that we've seen over the last three, four weeks as well. Christian jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Hope everything's going well for you. In Vegas, the Broncos come to your hometown and they get trucked like this. I, We, we feel for you, my dog. Um, he says, should we get an offensive head coach to take Locke to the next level or get an offensive head coach and replace Locke either with Fields, Lance, or Wilson? The, the head coach, I mean, barring a collapse – the rest of the season, Zach, I really don't see the Broncos making a head coach change so long as John Elway remains GM in football um, or president of football operations. So I'm going to go to the next thing, which is quarterback. You know, if Drew Locke is, I think this is something we talked about, Zach, right before we hit the old go live button, but I said something to the effect of, I thought after that third pick, there was a chance Fangio was going to bench him because several he was banged up. Obviously, Locke had been limping since about the second half of the second quarter, and you'd seen Brett Rippon not just chilling on the sideline with the clipboard, but helmet on, warming up. You know, he was ready to go. I thought, you know, this could be the point where they make a move. They did it, and I think that speaks to just the that's that's the order of the day. The Broncos are going to ride this season out with Drew Locke unless he gets hurt again. Knock on wood, and let the chips fall. And it might end up when you talk about how the chips fall. It could, Zach, end up with them going back to the QB well in the first round if this is the caliber of play they're going to get out of Drew Locke moving forward. 100% agreed. Um, I I don't think uh, Elway is going to fire Fangio, though he's going to face intense criticism as well, even with the pandemic and even with the injuries. What's one thing that GMs mostly do to save their own ass, which is, you know, have a scapegoat, which is the head coach. I still think Fangio gets 2021 because of the injuries and because his defense has played well. Locke, though, if he plays as he's played this season going forward, they're going to bring in another quarterback. We can't predict, though, who that's going to be because it will depend on their draft position. But they're going to bring some guy in. I would hope it's a younger guy. I don't want another veteran bandit. I don't want a Bridgewater or a Tyrod Taylor. I want a rookie who's going to come in because you have to keep swinging until you hit a home run. And I don't want any more base hits, Chad. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Tom jumping in to say, appreciate you, Tom. He says, the offense is so vanilla, no creativity, imagination, just embarrassing. Thanks, guys. Yeah, the I mean, again, I don't want to make this focus about the offense. And, you know, there are a lot of factors here and the whole idea, you know, the philosophy of it takes two to tango and all that. That's all true. But, guys, today was about Drew. Drew just sucked today. He was bad. And I know it rubbed a lot of people wrong, seeing him late in the game with the Broncos getting trounced kind of joking and laughing on the sideline and stuff. And look, have some, have some uh, recognition, have some, you know, I don't, I don't want to say class, but just have some recognition of your situation. Like it's just bad optics. And that only intensifies what Broncos fans, how they feel at this point, seeing it feels like Drew Locke is almost like he's embraced the madness, almost like he doesn't care how badly this is going off, off the rails. And that offends fans. Yeah, I, it, the coaching was bad. The quarterbacking was bad. The offensive line was bad. I, I mean, it, it was an all-around crappy operation, and it says a lot when your best player was Melvin Gordon, who was fighting for some yards. And like you mentioned, Chad, on the halftime stream, the yards he created, he had to break four or five tacklers at a time. So when you have a game like that, you know, everyone gets the blame. And guys, again, it has never been just Shermer or just Drew Locke. It's both of them. It's all of them. It's everyone. Everyone is complicit in what this disaster has morphed into. Mike, sorry, jumping in with the super. Appreciate you, Mike. He says, Locke has regressed hard, but it doesn't help that Shermer only calls the same four plays. Inside run, deep sideline, short cross, and curls. OC got to go. You know, this is an interesting question, an interesting topic, Mike, because we floated this last week after the Atlanta game that, you know, at what point – 
or is there a point where Vic Fangio moves on from Shermer because you've got Mike Shula, an accomplished and proven play caller, waiting in the wings at, at, as the quarterback's coach? Is there a point in the season, Zach, where you would turn the page on Shermer if you're Vic Fangio? I have a hard time seeing it because he's hitched his star to Shermer. You know, it was his decision, at least according to all of the public talking points from the Denver Broncos, the decision to fire Rich Gangarello and go after Pat Shermer was at the feet completely of Vic Fangio. So if you fire him, yeah, maybe you just say, look, I was wrong. It was, this is not, this is unacceptable. We're, we're making a change, but do you see something like that happening this season? Zach? I don't see him demoting Pat Shermer in season because that he might as well just fire him. If he does that at that point, you're giving up all hope that you brought in this former two-time head coach and this quarterback wizard, and he hasn't done anything for your quarterback. Uh, I, I'd be willing to see what Shula has, but when you look at Fangio, he status quo is his thing. Look at Tom McMahon, except for Scangarello. That was just a knee-jerk response by a guy who was in his first year and he didn't know anything about the head coaching position. My theory is that he hired Pat Shermer strictly because Shermer was a head coach and he he can leave that side of the ball alone. That's just me speculating, but that's what it seems like right now. For my money, Scangarello was way more creative and more imaginative uh, than Shermer's ever been. This is something I've been saying the entire season. Scangarello got too cute at times. He didn't know the right play calls at certain times, but his play calls in general brought more life to the offense. Why Locke went 4-1 and one with them? You can say Corbin's son. You can say the injuries. Locke was a better quarterback with the last coordinator. I still think, like you said, Vic Fangio has tied his wagon to Shermer's star, but how could you sell the fan base on Shermer coming back in 2021 with or without a new quarterback? How would you put you know fans in, in the stadium when you have Pat Shermer coming back as your coordinator? And it really is mystifying because Shermer does have a pedigree as a, as a coordinator and as a quarterback's guy. You know, he really does. So it's it's just it's just frustrating. It's mystifying. Muhammad Badri jumping in, one of our superstars. Appreciate you, my dog. He says, I don't know if we had higher expectations from Locke or the injuries. Hold on, this, this jumps off the page. Uh, or the injuries to the team is hurting him. I think, to be fair to Locke, we should give him another season before we make a decision on him. Now, right now, Zach, that might be a very unpopular theme in Broncos country. Broncos fans just – Based on the chat and what we're seeing, people, you know, texting, DMing, emailing me just before we even went live tonight, it feels like Broncos fans are ready to turn that page. But Zach, inside the building, the feeling is always a lot more, a lot less panicked and anxious than it is outside right. the building. And again, there's no, there's no sword waiting to fall. There is no guillotine hanging over Elway's head. He and, and Ellis have carte blanche until there's an ownership shift. And so they could very well agree here with Badri. It wouldn't surprise me. In fact, I would be willing to guess that right now, if you were a fly on the wall in one of those front office meetings heading, in, heading into week 11, the overall vibe would be, yeah, you know, this sucked. We got to get locked through this year. And, you know, well, he's our guy for 2021. Probably more so than the abject panic fans are feeling right now, whether right or wrong. I agree with you that the lo- in the front office sense and the locker room sense, it's a lot less emotional. It's more logic-based, and it's a lot more conservative than it is very panicked and impulsive. That being said, though, like I said with Shermer, how could you sell lock to the fan base? How could you commit to the guy for all of 2021 when he's looked like this this season? They tried that, Chad. They went away from a veteran quarterback. They went all in on Drew Locke. No quarterback competition, not even a notable backup quarterback behind him. It didn't work out this year. I think Locke returns in 2021. I think his roster spot is guaranteed, but his starting job is not. They're going to bring in someone, hopefully a rookie or a young player, or maybe a veteran, and have Locke, if he does, earn the job. No, Nothing more is given to him after this point. Russ Young, appreciate the super chat, my friend. It does mean a lot to us. And make sure you reach out and connect with us on Twitter. Chris Hernandez, 24-year veteran of the Air Force and a MHH Mount Rushmore member. Appreciate you, my dog. And his super chat tonight as is often the case, especially on game day, symbolic. Uh, 12 points, that's all the Broncos could muster today. And his his comment is coaching and execution. That is all. And, yeah, Zach, there's no getting around it. The Broncos were outcoached and outplayed today by a mile. 12 points. I, I never would have thought this. Go on Thursday's pod, we went over the uh, the Raiders' defensive rankings, and there was all that red, and they were so bad in certain areas. And I thought for sure the Broncos would have their pop game, and twelve points. They had a combined chat real quick. The CBS broadcast pointed out over the last two games, not including today's, six combined first half points in two games. Six. Yeah. That is sad. 
Very sad. Base case jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Sorry, I can't show your actual YouTube profile pic. The, the stream is just so fast tonight, but uh, we appreciate your support as always. He says, number three is not a good quarterback. Vic is not a good head coach. Elway is not a good GM. Not to mention ownership is a hot mess. It's a bad combination. It is a bad combination right now. And, you know, here's the one thing I'll say is we talked about this last week with Elway. The one thing I question is his head coaching moves from the time Gary Kubiak stepped on or stepped down on. But I think John Elway, to be honest with you, I think he did. I mean, you could pick a bone in terms of deciding to roll with Jeff Driscoll as your fail safe. Aside from that, I think John did a really good job. He didn't reach on lock. He waited until yep. the second round, even though guys like Zach and I were like, hey, man, first round caliber, Elway waited. And when the value was right to him, he took him in the second round. So he didn't reach. Saw enough from him in his rookie year to say, hey, let's give him 2020, stock the shelves, stock the cupboards, went all in on lock. It's This isn't a failure of Jerry Judy. This isn't a failure of KJ Hamler. This isn't a failure right. of Albert O who gets hurt. No fan, I'd love to see him play a heck of a lot better, and he's, he's played the last few games. But this isn't so much a failure, Zach, of Elway's personnel moves. If you want to blame anything on Elway at this point, it was, did he make the right decision to hire Vic Fangio? That's, and that's maybe a question for another time. Uh, this is all about Vic Fangio in this season and the, and the coaching overall and Drew Locke and the players just not being good enough to overcome this epidemic of injuries that, that they suffered in the first half of the season. Chad, you, you nailed that a thousand percent. And you can blame Elway for a season like 2017 when he hired Vance Joseph and they had the worst draft class I've ever seen. Uh, but this year he had a great draft class for at least for the future and somewhat for the interim. He made big moves for his quarterback. He got Jarrell Casey, a five time pro bowler for a seventh round pick, AJ Boye for a fourth round pick. I mean, he's, he literally finagled his way into building a pretty good roster. I don't fault Elway for a pandemic. I don't fault Elway, uh, for injuries. You could argue that that why not have you know DeMar Dotson in the game ahead of Elijah Wilkinson but like Chad mentioned the failures this season compared to years past are really not on John Elway this was on the coaching and Vic Fangio and Pat Shermer and who hired Pat Shermer like Chad mentioned earlier was Vic Fangio so again Elway's gonna get some slack because he hired Vic and it all oh crap always rolls downhill Chad But this was a big blight, I think, on Fangio's head coaching resume this season, and it might have proved why in 60 years he was never a head coach before. All right, W.E. jumping in. Then we got to do one really quick matter of business. Appreciate that super, my dog. He says, since Manning retired, three head coaches, multiple defensive coordinators, nine starting quarterbacks, and right now they are three and six for the fourth consecutive season yeah it has not been good my friend it's been you know it's just been a um comedy of of errors up to this point and you know again i'm always going to wonder and like zach said at the top of this podcast you know revisionist history woulda shoulda coulda you know if ifs and buts were candy and nuts we could go down that road but i'm always going to wonder how this season might have turned out if you get the 1400 reps combined between OTAs and preseason and it's a traditional season and Pat Shermer and Drew Locke get that time together and you have maybe not quite such a big bite from the injury bug but that's football man and there was no you know there's no excuses and the Broncos obviously their play has just been especially this last quarter of the season is barring the one success of coming back against the Chargers and beating the Patriots on the road it's just been ugly Zach. Yeah, and I just commended Elway for what he did this season, but when you look at the overall big picture, and that one comment triggered so much of my PTSD from covering this team the last half decade. The one denominator there, uh, among all the personnel moves and all the coaching moves, is John Elway. So overall, um, you can judge his GMing, you know, his GMship as maybe a little up and down, maybe very questionable. This season was not. But, Chad, when you look at the stats and look at the big picture, and year after year, they're the same moribund team. Who do you point the finger at then? Yep, it's it's like we're stuck in the time loop. You know, we're stuck in the uh, upside down. I want we're out. Thinking, we we have to tip our cap to another one of tonight's uh, presenting sponsors, sportsbetting.com, gang. Broncos country, gambling is now legal in the state of Colorado. This is old news to everybody. But here's what makes sportsbetting.com the no-brainer for sports fans. You get sharp odds. You get low juice. You get hassle-free bonuses, which you can roll over after only one time. 
which means the money is yours after you bet it one time compared to other sites who make you have to bet it five to 30 times before you actually get it. Plus, you get 24-7 live customer support, and it's always a real person in the United States. But here's the kicker and what you should really pay close attention to here on this read. At sportsbetting.com right now, you can get a 100% risk-free week of sports betting up to 1000 bucks, And it's not just one bet, but all of your bets. You play for a week, and if your losses exceed your winnings at the end of the week, sportsbetting.com will cover those losses 100%, the difference, up to a thousand bucks and you can roll it over after one time. So head on over to sportsbetting.com slash mile high huddle at sportsbetting.com slash mile high huddle and capitalize on a risk free week of sports betting up to a thousand bucks. Appreciate sportsbetting.com. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Real quick, I want to grab this from Christopher Dio. Appreciate you, my doc. He says, if you can't tell, uh, if you can't, excuse me, if you can't all see, Denver is purposefully tanking. Do you think they're purposely tanking? No No team purposely tanks. I mean, they can end up losing games and having a fortuitous record to get the number one pick, but no team is going out there and purposely throwing games. The Broncos do fight very hard. Uh, The box score today does not show that, but when you look at the games in, in weeks past, they come down to the wire, they fight hard. No, I don't subscribe to that. Drew Hollenbeck, love you. Longtime listener and big time superstar in our community. Appreciate you, Doc. He says, I've defended Locke at every turn. This was inexcusably bad. He has to play better, period, as does the coaching staff. Yes, Zach, I've I've already kind of floated my theory that Vic Fangio and Pat Shermer kind of told you everything you need to know when they chose not to bench Locke after his third pick. But do you think that maybe that you could see a quarterback change considering how how – I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to go overboard. But the the general positive buzz on Brett Rippon after his Week Four performance, I I just don't see it. And I think you were really onto something when you pointed that out. If they were going to replace Locke, why not do it in the second half when he's beat up and he's playing really poorly? If they were going to pull him, it would have happened this game. And then you go into the week with a quarterback competition. You make Locke earn it and make Rippon earn it. No, I, I think the Broncos still want to find out as they should, Chad. No, definitively, one way or the other, what Locke is. Right now, he's trending toward not being it, but they don't know that for sure. They want to give him the entirety of this season and then make a decision, and that's the right way to go about it. Uh, Mr. Boggins, love you, bro. And Mr. Boggins has been helping out MHH. He's now a moderator admin in our MHH uh, Broncos Superfan Facebook group, so appreciate everything you do. This is also a cat that has made multiple intros for – well, let me see. He we he made one for Huddle Up that we ran a few times, and then he made one for Mile High Insider. So Boggins, appreciate everything you do, Doc. He says, I've tried to defend him, but Locke may have lost me. I get the coaching, and O-line is not great, but he is missing reads, panicking, and not progressing. Agreed. Zach, again, you, get, you go back and look, and we don't have the benefit yet of the All-22 in this game, but I imagine it's going to – line right up with what it looked like on the TV broadcast. And that is missing open receivers, always being a beat late on his reads. And yeah, it doesn't help that his offensive line is sucking and they can't get a running game going, but you know, Drew Locke has to be better and he just hasn't shown it. It'd be one thing to come in in year two after everything that happened in the off season and just all those obstacles to overcome. And even the injury in week two, Zach, it'd be one thing to come in and not show like per- clear progression but what really is so concerning is that he's showing abject regression, and that's what's got everyone freaked out. Yeah, Boggins, uh, I'm right there with you. And again, this was Locke's, to me, his worst performance as a pro. He was the reason why Denver lost today's game. And uh, apparently, Chad, Fangio and his presser today said that they're sticking with Locke going forward, as expected. Uh, Andrew wants to know, thank you for the super chat, Andrew, why we haven't at least tried out Natani Muti. Of course, for those who are wondering who Natani Muti is, he was Denver's sixth round pick this year. And he was a guy that they drafted injured, who a lot of draft Knicks, Eric Trickles, uh, Nick Kendall's, Carl Delman, I don't remember the exact ranking, but he was viewed as a early day two caliber guard that just dropped because he everyone was scared of his injuries. And they got him healthy through training camp and took it easy on him, got him enough reps to feel good enough to keep him on the 53 instead of trying to sneak him on the injured reserve. He's been available all season long. Why haven't they tried Natani Muti, Zach? Because they paid $11 million this year for Graham Glasgow at right guard, 
And Dalton Reisner is a second round pick and a leader in the locker room that they are trying to stick with. So I do question why they didn't try Muti last the last two weeks when Glasgow was was in protocol because of the bug that she'll go unmentioned. But at this point forward, you know, they just, their resources are invested elsewhere. Muti is just going to have to wait. It's the same reason why entering the fourth quarter, Philip Lindsay had four carries and, and, you know, Melvin Gordon, I think, had 10 carries. When you pay a guy that much money, you have to try to justify that contract. And maybe it's just me, but I was and have been thoroughly unimpressed with Graham Glasgow. Is it too soon to say he was a free agent bust? Because for $11 million, Chad, I can find a lot better guards out there to play right guard. Yeah, I mean... At least in the case of Ronald Leary, the swing and the miss, you could point to the injury bug as being, hey, man, he played great for the Cowboys. We brought him in, paid him the money, and we just got bad luck with the with the injury bug. In the case of Glasgow, man, it's just been below average play at right guard. Ren, 99 jumping in. Appreciate that generosity hey. on Super yeah. Chat, buddy. He says the whole offensive line is trash. And by the way, Ren99, are you on Twitter? If so, reach out and connect with us because – I've tried finding you on Twitter when we do our, our post pod shout outs on Twitter to the superstars and I can't find you. He says, I don't think Locke has been on his back more all year as much as he was this year. Locke looked horrible today and that's on him. Uh, the offensive line and Shermer, this is becoming sickening. So yeah, let's just for a second. All right. Just for a second. Look, Locke's bad. We've, we've spent a lot of time and we're not done talking about how bad Locke has been. But Zach, the offensive line today, once again, it was Trash. ugly. And on one hand, you go, well, hey, man, they were down to their fifth right tackle today, right? Calvin Anderson, fifth guy on the death chart. I mean, talking from like training camp on, Jawan James, number one, Elijah Wilkinson, two, DeMar Dotson, three, Jake Rogers, four. Now you've got Calvin Anderson, a right tackle. But, you know, he wasn't really the big problem today. The big problem, once again, was interior pressure. It was, yeah. I just wonder, though, because uh, Anderson wasn't perfect either. A lot of pressure came off the right edge as well, and DeMar Dotson was active for today's game. Uh, he might have been injured. He might not have been uh, you know, just a, uh, an emergency option, but why not break that glass? When you're down, when your offense is struggling, why not put in your better right tackle? It's been a common theme this offseason and this season in general. Uh, the personnel management or mismanagement by the coaching staff has been baffling to me. It really has. John, I'm going to grab one or two more that have stacked up um, that the stream has jumped. So let's grab Freddie A. Appreciate the super chat, Freddie. Zach, he says rebuild with a question mark. Define rebuild. And if and whatever your rebuild definition is, Zach, is uh, has 2020 proved that it's time to do that? Well, to me, a rebuild is when you fire the head coach and, and clean it all out from top to bottom. It doesn't have to include the general manager, but a rebuild is not just firing a coordinator and, and picking up some pieces for your quarterback. So they're, they're going to blow it all up after one season and fire Shermer and fire Fangio, and get a new quarterback, or they're going to stick with the status quo for one more year, which aligns with Elway's contract. So no, I don't see a rebuild, like you said earlier on the halftime stream, until 2022. Yeah, I mean, they're... You can say start over at quarterback. That's imminent right. unless Locke turns it around significantly the, the last seven games of this season. But as Dylan says here, we appreciate the super, my friend, longtime listener, bona fide superstar. We, we're not seeing Dylan as often in the in the Huddle Up podcast live streams, but I know he's a dedicated listener, and we appreciate you, my dog. He says, we need an owner, plain and simple. And that's one of the things is, you know, there's the the, the, the spirit of self-preservation, right? Like, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what your profession is, one of the things that motivates people to excel in their jobs and go the extra mile and make the right decisions and all that is the fear of loss, the fear that the guy above them might come in and pull their plug and say, you're fired. That's not good enough. Zach, there is no threat of the guillotine right now in Denver. And look, maybe Joe Ellis eventually just says, look, John, well, that was one hell of a ride from 2011 to 2015, but it's just been, you know, bad lately. I got to, I got to turn the page. I, I just don't see that happening. I think Ellis and Elway honestly are tied at the hip. And until there's an ownership change, as Dylan points out here, um, it's just Elway's the guy. And, and until that changes, it's probably going to be more of the same because Fangio, you know, Zach, how can you as a GM fire another head coach in yeah. that quick of a turnaround and, and still stand up and, and at a podium and say, I'm the guy to lead this team you know, from a macro perspective. 
I agree that it's it's worrisome that there's no one to check Elway's balances, and it's why there's even three branches of government for the president. They 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 have you know veto power to check his balances. Elway has run amok in the front office. He's done what he wants for almost a decade now, and for the first half, like you mentioned, Chad, it was great success. He brought a title home, but the last half decade has not been good. I just don't see Joe Ellis of all people having the stones to fire a franchise goat, a legend like Elway. I don't see that happening. I don't. Look, again, guys, I agree that that um, you're probably not going to see lasting, meaningful change until there is an ownership shift. However, again, I really don't think today, you know, in terms of what's plaguing this team today, all right, 2020, I really don't think, I mean, the buck stops with Elway, but guys, this is an on-field problem. And Elway, you can, you can try and take it all the way back to the decision to hire Fangio and it stops there. But I'm telling you, this is – the coach is failing on the sideline, and this yes. is the players failing on the field. Uh, David Kilgore jumping in, bona fide superstar. Look at that profile pick, the hat, the face mask. We love you. DK, Appreciate you. Good to see you, dog. Yeah. We need to do everything possible to either get Trevor Lawrence or Sewell in the draft. That's my opinion. Well, let me tell you, I don't know about Sewell, but Zach, it would cost an arm. Who knows? Getting. I mean, shoot, they're three. They could end up with only three wins this year. You're Maybe that puts it. them closer to striking distance on Lawrence. But I just have a hard time seeing John Elway going out and saying, "Here's a you know brace of first and second round picks, trying to get from you know they'll probably finish somewhere pick six through eleven somewhere in there. You're you're still giving up an arm and a leg to get Lawrence. But if that if if this has proven anything, if Locke doesn't turn it around and it's not looking like he's going to. If this does, if proves anything, Zach, it's that go look, go out and do what it takes to get the guy. Go find the guarantee, and there might, there might not be a guarantee, but go get that guy. What would what would preclude you from doing so if you're John Elway this time? If Drew Locke really does fail to turn it around, well, you can want to get your guy, but you have to be realistic. The Jets are not going to give up Trevor Lawrence. They they might be losing out for Trevor Lawrence. You can get them six first round picks. It's not going to make a difference. So you have to kind of adjust your expectations as to the quarterback you want in this draft class. Even if they finish two overall, you still have to trade with the Jets to get Trevor Lawrence. They're not giving that slot up. So you have to kind of look to Fields or Lance or Zach Wilson. There are quarterbacks in this draft. Who the Broncos should draft though is completely uh, subjective. Your opinion. Christian, we just noticed that you had a couple of supers on the on the same topic and in turn, we do appreciate the support, my friend, and hopefully you saw our answer to this earlier. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see in terms of the, the head coaching job. We don't think that's changing in the near future. And if Drew Locke doesn't turn the ship around, you know, they, they're definitely going to be going back to the QB well. Real quick, Richie Richie, I didn't realize <clears throat> somehow it escaped me. He's north of the 49th parallel. This is one of our Canadian brethren in the yeah. MHH community and proving that Broncos country is not a geographic location. It is a hashtag. State of being. Love you, buddy. First three quarters, same every game. We need to see Brett. And then, Zach, you mentioned Vic Fangio post-game. He's saying, no, nope, we're sticking with Locke. And Dylan W. saying, my hand's on the panic button on Drew Locke. So are they wrong? Because I don't think they are. Look, I think at this stage, is is Brett Rippon going to stave off disaster? The season's over. Now's the time to get a definitive answer on Drew. And right now the answer is no, right? The answer is this isn't the guy we thought he was, but he's not, but you got to be able to know for sure. And I think that if you stick with him through seven games, you have a better chance of having that clarity going into 2021. Whereas with Brett, if you pulled, if you pulled lock going into next week, Zach, there are always going to be those questions of, did we, did we act too early? Right. What could have happened? Right. It, cloud, it clouds what you can do in 2021. Right, exactly. Yeah, take it from someone, guys, who watched a lot of Jets football in the past, in a past life. The backup quarterback, when you don't have the franchise guy, is always the most popular player. You you only want Rippon right now because he's not Drew Locke. I can make this a political thing and say you guys voted for some guys because he wasn't the other candidate. It's the same thing for a quarterback. If it's not Locke, it's not going to be Brett Rippon or Jeff Driscoll or Blake Bortles. You need a blue chip quarterback. So again, you have to swing for the fence, fences until you hit a home run. No more doubles, no more base hits, a home run, a blue chip guy. Uh, sure you're jumping in. It's good to see you, my friend. Thanks for being with us. He says, is there any way we can hire Mike Shanahan, move Vic to defense? Uh-huh. No way. Is there a way? Sure, there's a way. Is it going to happen? Not in this world. Maybe in a parallel universe. You know, you, if we can turn this podcast into a, 
a discourse on string theory and talk about parallel reality <laughs> and where that could happen. But it ain't, dude, not in this world. Um, they had a chance, and it almost happened after Van, or, uh, VJ, Vance Joseph's first year, but no, it's just not going to happen. We need Neil deGrasse Tyson on this podcast. He'll break it down for us. No, but here's the thing in the NFL. Coaches won't be demoted and go to a lesser position. So it's either you fire Vic or you keep him at his current capacity. So the Mike Shanahan boat, it's it's long gone, guys. Long gone. There were old days where weird stuff like that would happen and, and coaches would stick around, but no longer. Bobby jumping in. Top rope. A bona fide superstar. Wow. She's an MHH Mount Rushmore Amazing. member. And what's awesome about Bobby is – you know, she joined us like right after the, <clears throat> excuse me, after the draft as a, as an audience member. And man, she has just become so important to us. And we love you. We appreciate you, Poppy. And yes. this is a message to Poppy. This is a message to everybody. <clears throat> keep your chin up. All right. Just keep your chin up. Enjoy this for what it is. We're evaluating the Broncos. It's fun. It's football. You know, things could always be a heck of a lot worse. And maybe not on the field when you're getting trounced, you know, 37 to 12. But as she says here, <clears throat> excuse me, it was hard watching the game today but I'm showing some love for you guys. And we, we appreciate that so much, Bobby, because yeah. really our job is to show up for you guys, whether it's a win or a loss and to analyze this thing and be here to break this down win or loss, Zach. And so we do appreciate that, that support from you, Bobby, and from all of our superstars and that, that acknowledgement. Yeah. And the fact that even in a tough loss, uh, people like Bobby want to spread positivity. The world can use more people like that and more vibes and feelings like that. So thank you so, so much, Bobby, for your continued support. Antonio, <clears throat> sorry, man, this frog uh, in my throat jumping in. He says, uh, and thank you, Antonio. He says, guys, I'd love to get your opinion on what needs to change to get back to our winning ways. We were spoiled with our winning years for so long that these couple of losing seasons hurt. Oh. I wish it was just a couple. But, you know, you're looking at 16, 17, 18, 19. This is five years in a row. This is this team is cruising for, uh, well, for sure, missing the playoffs. I shouldn't say for sure, but. Definitely not going to – That's for sure. <laughs> they're not making the playoffs, <laughs> right? And, and even though I was saying last week until they're mathematically eliminated, look, my outlook on everything is I don't give up. I maintain optimism. I fight it to the bitter end, and I'm going to maintain that, that, but that, that philosophy and that outlook. But, Zach, I'm not going to lie to you either. This is not a team that has the complexion of, all right, we started off on the wrong foot. We figured some things out. We tweaked it, and we're you know down the stretch. We're going to be a factor today. Proved that, so I can feel pretty comfortable telling you this isn't a team cruising, angling for that seventh playoff seed. No, and and last couple of weeks or so, I've been referencing the 2007 Giants and how they were you know very bad in the first half, and they went on to win a title in the second half. I feel so crunchy for saying that right now. I'm giving up on that as well. They're not going to be a playoff team, but it's not a reason why you shouldn't watch another minute of Broncos football either. So it's but, kind of in the middle. To Antonio's question, which we didn't really answer, what needs to change? It really comes down to quarterback, all right? And the, unfortunately, up to this point, Drew has proved more that he's not the answer than he is the answer, and the Broncos are tied to him this year. Now, if you can get the right quarterback, maybe all of a sudden Vic Fangio, his, his coaching foibles, and as he's kind of figuring things out, and Pat Shermer and all you know, it's not as big of an impact on the product on the field and they can kind of get a get a swell of momentum. It really does start with the quarterback, which is why, despite all the injuries, it really came down to Drew and Drew's just not showing us. So, you know, you could talk about starting over as Dylan is advocating here. We need an owner. Fire everybody after this season and just blow it up. Start over, even though you got a lot of talent at different parts on this on this squad. But really, it just comes down to quarterback. Like if you took, and I don't say this to create even more quarterback envy, but Zach, if you took a Trevor Lawrence and put him on this team, guess what? This is probably at worst, even in a bad year like this injury-wise, this is probably a 500 team. Trevor Lawrence elevates. That's what you can do with the right quarterback. And the Broncos, unfortunately, they're probably going to finish this year, Zach, again, just out of striking distance for one of those top for I would say Lawrence or Fields, maybe they would have a chance at Wilson. But Wilson from BYU, Zach Wilson, he's a guy, Zach, that you know, you know, he's very reminds me a lot in many ways of Josh Allen, where mm -hmm. Josh Allen's turned out to be the genuine article in the league, but he's so raw and he's so kind of new to the to playing at the level that he's playing at that it's hard to to justify 
with confidence investing in first round picks. So to me, it really is the only guarantee guy this year to me, Zach is Lawrence. That's the only guy that I would feel comfortable 100% if you're the Broncos, at least right now, anyway, spending a first round pick. But what is the reason for, for Allen's transformation? What is the reason why he went from being a raw prospect to being molded into something he is now, which is an MVP candidate, Brian Dayball on the coaching there. And so you're, I understand what you're saying, Chad, that Trevor Lawrence, the quality of quarterback under center would make a difference. But do you feel comfortable with having Pat Shermer develop Trevor Lawrence or call plays for Trevor Lawrence? It goes hand in hand. So what has to change is quarterbacking and coaching. They need a reset at those spots. And that, I think, is going to happen before an entire organizational uh, house cleaning is going to happen. Mark Langley jumping off the top rope, showing that love wow. and support. And um, I was hoping that you would get a win this week to kind of celebrate birthday week and kind of close it off well for you, Mark. But it didn't shake out that way. And, um, you know, there's a guy that's here like us and like you guys that are with us today. Hell or high water, rain, sleet or snow. He's showing up for his team and for MHH. And we love you, Mark. Appreciate you, my friend. Yes. He says, what's up, my guys? Chad, it it was good talking to you, but what the hell is going on, guys? Zach, you're the best. Your honesty is priceless, but I stopped my breaks on lock for now. He needs reps and a full offseason of practice. It's going to take time. Hashtag football priest. And, Zach, this was a philosophy that um, I shared in to a certain point in that, you know, you need to give a quarterback some time to figure things out. But and maybe the Broncos still haven't. He maybe Locke hasn't received enough time quite yet to work through some of these things and fully develop. But the unfortunate reality of the modern NFL, and this is something that I have to acknowledge, whether I like it or not, is that you don't have four or five years like you did in the old days to figure out the quarterback to right. nurse through that development. I mean, John Elway, guys. I know a lot of you weren't even born when John Elway was a rookie or in a second year player. Um, those of you who were born, I mean, you can remember back into the eighties. I mean, if it was the modern media landscape where social media podcast on everyone's phone in everyone's pocket immediately following the game and all this, you know, does John Elway survive to year three? Maybe not in, if, if, you know, you you flip that, but this isn't, this is 2020. That was 1983 or 1984. And the reality is they have to come out of the box pretty close, man, to, to being legit. Like look at Kyler Murray stud today, Justin Herbert, again, another losing effort, but still looks really good in terms of it's never the offense's fault. It's always that defense for the chargers. We could go down the list uh, in terms of, you know, Joe Burrow. I, I'm not, I didn't get a chance to see Zach today, how the Bengals did, but nevertheless, it's, just, <laughs> it's a modern NFL, dude. You got to come out of the box to be in the dude. And it's, it might be unfair, but it just doesn't bode well for guys like Drew Locke. Josh Allen's kind of the exception where, you know, he wasn't great his first year, but then the second year he really sh- took a leap. And then here he is now really pushing the envelope two years in a row where he's a contender. So do the Broncos have that kind of organizational patience considering the last four and a half seasons? I don't think so, which is why if Locke doesn't take a quantum leap in these final seven games, they're going back to the QB well. Yeah, very well said, and I agree. I mean, you don't have three, four years to give a quarterback time to grow into the position. And you mentioned Kyler Murray. What happened with Josh Rosen, his predecessor? He was thrown out the window for a young quarterback who was a better quarterback for their, for their team, and they went hand-in-hand with Cliff Kingsbury. There's a very real chance, whether or not the Broncos keep Fangio, which Chad and I both think they will, that they can draft a quarterback and have Locke on the team or maybe trade him or release him or whatever, but they have to go find their guy. If they're not convicted that Locke is their guy, they have to go find that guy. And Mark, I'm not off the Locke train just yet, but I'm kind of hanging off the door right now. I'm kind of hanging out the uh, the old cargo hold. It's, it's tough to keep supporting the guy when he's letting down and kind of playing counter to what I'm advocating for. You hang in, you hang in, right? And you're like, come on, this is, you can turn around, this is the week, but it, you're just not seeing any. This was the first game, really, since Locke came back, that there's just not one single silver lining yeah. to hang your hat on. And what makes that alarming is that you're now well into the second half of the season. You're, this isn't week two, week three, where you're like, all right, he's got the, there is no time. The meaningful portion of the season, in terms of putting you in the conversation, it's over. And you're just not seeing that step forward from Locke, Russ Young. Jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. You. A name we don't recognize, but thank you for the support and welcome. Stick around. He says, this team doesn't care. Zach, as I grab this super chat from Dale uh, Rudd, do you believe 
uh, that this is a team that has stopped caring. And Dale says, as Edna Mould said in The Incredibles, luck favors the prepared. Denver never looks prepared. I think, I don't think they've given up. I think they care, but I think a lot of what Fangio preaches is falling on deaf ears at this point. He preaches the tough guy thing, the no death by inches, but like that comment said, they're never prepared. And like another comment said, Fangio is regularly outcoached by the opposing team. And that says a lot. The players are not ready to go. They're not prepared. The game plans are off. He's not a well-rounded coach. So uh, that's how I feel about the situation. Yeah, it is what it is. We got Josh Johnson jumping in. Thank you, Joshua. He says, players that should play, players that should play get cut. Players that are bad don't get benched. No accountability. I wouldn't want to play that's for that exactly. coaching staff. I don't know. I'm not sure that's perfectly fair, Zach, because, I mean, the injury bug has decimated this roster. Like, they're trying to make hay with what, what sunshine remains. And you could point to a few spots, like, you know, you could point to the right tackle. You could point to that's punt returner, punt returner, Devontae Harris, quarterback, Devon, the whole Devontae Bosby situation of the, of the previous, you know, three weeks ago. That was a head scratcher. But honestly, I think in terms of making things work with what the way the injury bug has decimated this team, like that's one credit I'll give Fangio. It hasn't helped the in the standings, but like, Maybe if Fangio and his coaching staff do a worse job in terms of making, you know, capitalizing on on what talent remains, this would be a, a, an O for team. Maybe this would be one win, and that comes in week four with Brett Rippon. This was kind of, you know, piggybacking off my last comment. When Let me just say, Chad, I understand the injury concerns. I understand the pandemic. I understand all the excuses. But when you have a tackle in there, I use that word loosely, a tackle like Elijah Wilkinson, getting your quarterback literally injured and sacked and hit every down, and you don't bench him until he gets injured for a guy you sign off the scrap heap, other players see that. Other players buy into that. And that's what I'm saying with Fangio. He talks a big game, but there's nothing that comes of it. It's all talk and no walk with him. And he's is falling on deaf ears at this point. So I don't think he's losing them or there's a mutiny, but I think a lot of them are realizing Fangio kind of like we are for what he is. Uh, Dank Buds and Black Metal jumping in as we're cro- we have officially crossed the one hour mark. So we got to really rapid fire these remaining superstars here and help exercise the demons tonight. Appreciate you, Dank Buds. He says, fellas, I've been trying to talk myself into sticking with Locke, but he stares down. Almost every receiver has no idea what an audible is that I see. Yeah. And that's one thing I was I was thinking myself, to be honest with you, Zach, is, you know, I, I would be curious to see if if Brett Rippon could come in in the third quarter. It's not necessarily me advocating to bench Locke, but I was curious to see, hey, man, if Vic Fangio does make that decision, benches Locke after his third pick, I'd be curious to see if some of the protection issues cha- uh, are, are improved because – Rippon is making the pre-snap reads and protection calls that can kind of um, mitigate the rush that has been so obviously impacting Locke's ability in the pocket. Yeah, I mean, Rippon was always a headier quarterback, and that was always his big trait over Locke, whereas Locke had the bigger arm and the athleticism. But I, I, no quarterback on the current roster is saving this team with the coaching and the offensive line and the injuries. It's just a terrible, you know, dumpster fire of a situation all the way around. I hate to say it. All right, Dylan, jumping in. Uh, excuse me, this is Onyx. My bad. Um, appreciate you, Onyx. Do we just blame it all on injuries this season, or do we start firing coaches this offseason? Both. I think that injuries definitely play a huge role in this, and to 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 not make that part of the equation, you know, you're not being fair. But at the same time, the coaching, in terms of in terms of the scheme, and even today, Zach, you talked a lot about this early in the show, and then during halftime. I mean, Fangio. Uh, that decision to accept the penalty on third down um, that turned it into a punt instead of a turnover on downs when they failed to get it on or not. A, it was it a fourth punt? down? That's right. That's right. But they ended up punting it right. Instead of taking the ball over on downs and they're pinned inside the five, like little things like that. But that nevertheless, is. injuries have played a huge role. And Kevin G jumps in to say, how do you think the injuries have to do with the losing season? And do you think Vaughn uh, can make a, a change? I don't know about Vaughn. Do, do you think he's no. saying Vic? or change the product on the field. Vaughn's not going to impact what's happening on the field right now. No, it's going to be the, I mean, he'll maybe get a sack or two, but it's Vaughn to less than a hundred percent. And he can't, he can't play quarterback. 
He can't play receiver. He can't play running back. He can't play offensive line. Um, I can blame the injuries to an extent, but we've seen the play calling, Chad, and we've seen the special teams. I am firing Tom McManney yesterday. I'm not waiting on that. You guys want to debate about Pat Shermer and Munchak and Shula. That's fine, but it's indisputable that Tom McMahon needs to get pink slipped now. We got one here from Prank Films. Thank you, my friend. Good to see you. To be fair, Josh Allen was just like Drew Locke in his first couple of years. I think we do have a big problem with John Elway and honestly, our budget O-line. Yeah, I mean, let's see. So Allen was a first round pick in 2018. 2018, he struggled as a rookie and looked like all every bit the raw, you know, extremely talented, but raw product that he was. But in 2019, the Bills were one of those worst to first stories in the NFL. That was last year. That was his second year. And in his third year, they're up there again in terms of being a, comp- a competitive squad. So that's one thing is there was a similarity, but where they're both kind of going like actually going like this. And at about this point where you're at right now, Allen started going up and Locke's continuing to go down. So right. they're, they're no longer really allegories because, you know, what was it, 11 games maybe, I think. But Drew Locke has, let's see, five last year. Nevertheless, it's just it's, it's no longer an apples to apples um, comparison. But the Broncos and the Bills had the same ideology about their quarterbacks. You know, the Bills went out and got Stephon Diggs. They got John Brown. The Broncos went out and got Jerry Judy and KJ Hamler. It's just that the Bills had a better offensive line and the Broncos, it's, it's a, you know, a a meal piece kind of unit, but they're not as good as Buffalo's. And to me, again, it's the coaching because Josh Allen was a guy like Lamar Jackson who could barely throw a ball accurately. He was, his accuracy was worse than than Drew Locks, but Brian Dayball in Buffalo has done a great job. Can you say the same thing about Pat Shermer? No, you cannot. That is the difference there. That's a great point. That is a great point. That's been one of the most impressive coaching feats in the NFL over the last couple of years is just the overall job that staff in Buffalo has done. Broncos, meanwhile, can't get out of their own way. Kenneth Booker, good to see you, my dog. Talk about a superstar. He says, Fangio is John 2.0 minus Peyton. Hard to refute that at this stage, Zach. Even, you know, both defensive-minded coaches, one had the benefit of a future Hall of Famer. The other one's got, you know, Drew Locke struggling and an offensive coordinator that can't figure out how to help this kid. God, we're seeing uh, Vic Fangio likened to John Fox. We're seeing Drew Locke likened to Pax and Lynch chat. I really hate 2020. <laughs> it's the worst year. And one of those, I mean, I've never seen anything like it in my 41 years. I'll be 41 soon on this earth. Uh, Adidas Freak, appreciate you. He says, starts at the top. Owner, GM, coach, team. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, the buck does stop with Elway. But, again, if we're being realistic, uh, there's just no change coming at the top of the um, totem pole. And so then you got to wonder how that shifts everything. It's just not going to happen. I could I could maybe see a coaching change, Zach, if the Broncos lose every single game with what's left in the season. But I just don't. Maybe they will, but I doubt it. Yeah, I don't see that either. I don't see them losing every game like they lost today, and I, I expect them to actually get a few more wins somehow, pulling out of their behinds. You're not going to fire Elway. I don't think they're going to fire Fangio, but you can make some micro adjustments to the coaching staff. You can get a new quarterback. You can get a new special teams coordinator. I just think they're in it with mostly the status quo for next season. But soon it feels – I mean, look, if it's another couple of weeks, just like the last two at Atlanta – um, this game, I, there's going to be some sort of a sacrificial lamb. Like Fangio has to feed some some red meat to the wolves, so to speak. Um, and I'm guessing at this stage, when that time comes, it's probably going to be – well, it's going to be one of the coordinators, and if, it's pretty obvious to see who it's, pro- it's going to be, and that's the special teams. Stu Meat jumping in with a super sticker, and it, the Damn. message said game over. It doesn't translate when we try to copy it and put it on the screen, but appreciate you. And then also Jeff C. jumping in. Good to see you, my friend. And his his point is – Hard to watch. Locke had his time and then some. He didn't just suck this game. Last game, too. We need to blow this up completely, including the brass. Hashtag start over. And I understand that that feeling right now, gang, but it's just not going to happen. And so I think there are some pieces here, Zach, that you can s- still be excited about as a, as a fan base. And, I mean, just look at offense. Jerry Judy, K.J. Hamler. Right. Still got Philip Lindsay, although – the last two weeks, they haven't figured out. They barely fed him, and he's, you know, look. I think we can admit now he's not receiving's not his his forte. Even though Gordon sucked today as a receiver as well with a couple of drops, he. But Philip Lindsay needs to get more in the rhythm. They took too long to try and even get him involved. And I tip my cap to Gordon, who had some really hard runs in the first half. Yeah. But 
this is just an offense completely out of whack and out of balance. Like they just literally have no identity. Don't know which way's up. You know, it's it's hard to watch. And Carlos says, uh, why say it was the Jets? Locke can't beat anyone. Well, he did beat the Patriots. Yeah. And he did beat the Chargers. And it is the NFL. So you can't take that away from him. But it's been uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'll, I'll say three of the last four weeks have been hard to watch offensive football. And even the, even the Patriots game, man. 18 points. Yeah. You got six scoring drives, none of which are a touchdown, and receivers dropping four touchdowns. We said it was the Jets because it's the Jets. They're far and away the worst team in the NFL, and it's not that great of an accomplishment when you have to struggle to beat them. Uh, so Locke has beaten some opponents this year. He beat he beat some good teams last year, like the Texans, the Chargers as well. Um, it doesn't exonerate him from blame. He was truly terrible today. He was the worst I've ever seen him. But to say he's beaten no one, I, I think is a little incorrect factually. Donald uh, Netanyahu jumping in on Super Chat, a name that is obviously funny, but we don't recognize on Super Chat. So welcome and thank you. Second quarter, fourth and one, Oakland's ball, and we stop him short while uh, while Oakland, I guess Raiders, were also called for holding. We chose the penalty instead of the turnover on downs. Raiders punted, pinned us on the one. WTF. WTF indeed. And this was something that we talked about from – uh, during the halftime stream all the way up to this point, that's another, like, who's whispering that? And where's the analytics guy that says, no, 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 coach, let's make a measure. And then you can just, I don't know, maybe there's a procedural order there where you either have to accept a penalty or have a measure. And But I don't no. think so. I think you could have had a measure and then decided whether or not to accept a penalty. Uh, the only counter I've seen is that the refs gave him the first down, but where is Fangio screaming for an official, calling a timeout, throwing the challenge flag? He doesn't need someone to tell him that, Chad. If I can see it on the computer, he can see it on the field. That's where Fangio comes up way short as a head coach. There is no reason why. It would have been a turnover on downs if they stopped him, and it looked like he was short to me. But you give him, you accept a penalty, let them punt? I have never seen anything like that. That was a new one for me. Jonathan Trevera is jumping back in. Appreciate you, my friend. Um, we're getting long, so we got to really rapid fire these remaining supers and help you exercise those demons. He says, scenario, Fangio walks into Elway's office after this game. You're John Elway. What do you tell Vic? Put your big boy pants on. Be a head coach. Take some responsibility. Get in there. Mix it up with Pat Shermer. Maybe take his play calling away. Maybe include my Shula Moore in the play calling. I tell Vic to take hold of your team and make the offense better. As the head coach, it might not be fair. He's a defensive guy, but he's still the head coach of the team. That's what I'm telling him. I'm telling him <clears throat> we got no choice but to, to roll with Locke. That's the correct decision. Let's figure out the offensive coordinator situation. Like if, if you don't, if Pat can't, if Pat can't turn the ship around, give, give Mike Shula a chance and do it quick. Because if you want to have a hope of turning the ship around with Drew Locke and trying to salvage this and that hope and that optimism and that belief you had in him as a player going into 2020, it doesn't seem like Pat Shermer's the guy to do it. Like you're, he's presided over a regression and, you know, Shula shares complicity in that as well, Zach, as he's the quarterback's coach, but, you know, I'm t- I'm telling Vic like you got to be ready now to fall on a sword and say maybe be ready. Not necessarily do it today, but you've got to be ready to fall on a sword and say I was wrong on Shermer. Yeah, I'm turning to another guy, Brian Ware, jumping in. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Howie needs to hire Eric Bieniemy as the head coach, and hopefully we can convince uh, Vic to stay as the defensive coordinator. Not going to happen. Again, in this day and age, it doesn't happen where a, a coach gets demoted or stays with the team. It's either you have Vic as the head coach or Vic not at all. The enemy would be a good hire, I believe. You have to wonder how much of that is Andy Reid. You have to factor in uh, the Broncos would have to surrender two third-round picks in consecutive years. And you have to wonder if the Broncos want another rookie head coach after failing with VJ and now Vic Fangio. All right, we got one here from – let me see where we're at. Uh, from our friend Tony, Discount Audio and Wheels, DA Dub. Good to see you, my friend. He says, I cannot defend Locke. It's clear he's not the guy. We'll blame the coach or the OC, but he's throwing those picks to covered guys. He can't handle pressure or dissect a defense. Ne- uh, Nathan Peterman, 2.0. Prove me wrong. Stats, uh, fa- film oh. don't lie. Yeah, I mean, it's not looking good right now. I would say that, you know, just to be, um, you know, just to pick a nit slightly is as bad as it was today. It's still too early to say completely that he's not the guy because he's going to have seven more games to put in a body of work, but it doesn't look like it. I mean, this has been now 
for five weeks of lackluster. Uh, you know what? Listen, I I think his game in, in New England was actually pretty um, pretty good. He was on point, dropping dimes. Those two fourth quarter interceptions, though, marred what would have been a good performance by him as a quarterback where he would have been completely absolved of any, you know, you can't point to him as, as the reason why things didn't go perfectly for Denver. But from there on out, dude, barring two miraculous fourth quarters, it's been crappy. So the ticker is pointing towards not the guy. That's something I'm not going to disagree with you on. The only thing I'm going to say is there's still time for him to turn the ship around as unlikely as that may seem like right now. Listen, I know Locke was really terrible today. I know you guys are really mad and upset right now, but Nathan Peterman, I mean, really, until he throws, Locke throws five first half interceptions and it looks that bad. And let's not go that crazy. He was bad today, but there's a reason why Peterman is, is Peterman. Uh, John Mortensen jumping in. Good to see you, my friend. He says, they are not coaching Locke. I'm good. I, excuse me. I'm with going with an offensive coach. Fangio is dependent on Shermer. Shermer is in his own little world. Bring back Kubiak and Wade Phillips. Do something. Locke is not getting coached. Yeah, the, the Kubiak and Wade thing, that's a, that's a ship that sailed, John. It's just not going to happen. Um, and, yeah, we agree that whatever the coaches are doing with Locke, it ain't working. And so if you're going to ride it out with, with Drew Locke, something has to change on the coaching level. And I do think it's scheme. I really do. I don't think Shermer – and it's not all on Shermer. Again, this is gray. This is a, a gray conversation because there's different shades here. But I do think there are different things Shermer could be doing, and he's just we're not seeing it. Duke says it's just a game. At least we all woke up on the right side of the earth this morning. That, there's some, there's some, uh, you know, perspective. I guess that. Yeah, it's it's still just a game, guys, and you know it's uh, there's a lot more things that are worth worrying about than a football game. So it's good perspective. We got Judah Walker jumping in to say. Um, what is it about him that is keeping us from calling Locke the guy? Chargers, Cards, Bills had bad records, but knew they had their future QB. Um, you, it's the it's the regression. It's the in critical moments. It's like Zach and I talked about during the rapid reaction halftime stream. Is so in the second quarter they drive down. Locke scores a touchdown. Right, runs it in himself. It gets called back on a Noah Fant penalty. I knew right then and there, the next play, I hate to say it, but I knew this was going to be a Drew Locke pick or a bad play is going to happen because he's a, he, he in those situations, he, he takes it from bad to worse. He has a pension as a quarterback from – and it's not so much that going in a shell. It's almost like some kind of an emotional what the heck, dude, like like I give up almost type thing. Yeah. Like screw it. Ball. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, man, this ain't the SEC. This is the NFL yeah. and – Time is your your opportunity is finite and he's blowing it right now. He is, and you can't defend him today. Like you mentioned it perfectly before, any other loss, even the Chiefs game, you can take away some silver linings or bronze linings as they were from Locke's game. Today, there's none. He was indisputably, inarguably bad, and turn the page bad, as it were. Yep. And uh, Chloe says, "Just found y'all happy. I did. Well, welcome. Thank, Thank you, Chloe. Uh, Deke." Uh, DK uh, Typer, 182, appreciate you, says, I understand the hate for Pat Shermer, but we need stability in our offense. I still believe in Locke. They need reps and stability. You know, that's the that's the uh, ultimate half-glass full perspective here, Zach, is that, that you know, you just got to give him more reps, more reps, more reps, and eventually the ship will turn. And maybe there's some truth to it, but, it's again, it's the modern NFL, and you don't get four or five years to figure it out, which is why it was so crucial to – hit the ground running in, in 2020. And again, I take it back all the way to the, to the skin gorilla decision, which I was actually okay with. You were more questioning of it than myself. I was excited about the prospect of Pat Shermer coming in and then uh, the pandemic and that completely changed everything. And now it's looking like probably the, the decision that's going to ultimately haunt Fangio's entire um, career as, as head coach in Denver. A previous point I wanted to make kind of a pro to nothing right now. If anything, what Gary Kubiak showed the last four years, he was a hell of a coach for this team. He really was a well-rounded, great coach that when he re- when he resigned, when he walked away, it was a blow the Broncos have not been able to overcome. He was that good. All right, guys, we got to get going here. One or two more, and then we, we got to just rapid fire. NH5 jumping in. Good to see you. Thanks for the support. He says, uh, just some small support. Thanks for doing the pods, guys. This team <laughs> makes me day drink. I feel you, my dog. Thank Poor you. Seltzer. We really do appreciate it. Corey H. 
Uh, the Broncos are loaded with young talent. We have the makings of a very competitive team. This is a failure of our QB. If we have to replace, so be it. But there is talent everywhere on this roster. And I do agree. Again, that's something I mentioned just a few minutes ago is you do have talent here, Zach. If you can get the quarterback situation figured out, maybe you can turn the ship around, but it's probably not going to happen in 2020. Yeah, and to Kenneth's point, you're you're not going to get the quarterback situation turned around with Trevor Lawrence. There, there's literally no shot the Broncos have of him. He's going to the Jets. You can talk about Trey Lance. You can talk about Justin Fields. You can talk about Zach Wilson, but you guys can get Trevor Lawrence out of your brains uh, now. Yeah, he's he's not saying that Trevor Lawrence couldn't turn the ship around. He's saying that Trevor Lawrence is going to be out of reach. So, yeah. uh, and again, thank you, Kenneth. Appreciate that uh, super chat and your support, as always, my friend. Uh, John, my stream just did a jump, so let me just grab here. I don't know if you have Glenn. Do you have Glenn Hauser? If not, let me just throw him on here real quick. Appreciate you, dog. Uh, love you, Glenn. This is a man who I have a deep affection and respect for. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here with us. He says, gulp, hashtag state of being, hashtag MHH, hashtag what a year. And Zach, yep. that, that's just the way she's gone so far. And we have another six weeks of this year left to go. I can only imagine. <laughs> Evan. Is it seven? Even worse. Right? Three and six, nine, yeah, seven, seven more to go. So, Glenn, love you, buddy. Hope everything's going good on in your neck of the woods, and uh, congrats on your podcast. Uh, let's grab Isaiah. Appreciate you, Isaiah. He says, uh, guys, I have no words. One yard in the second half at the 12-minute mark of the fourth quarter is lock or Shermer. Is it lock or Shermer? Injuries are injuries, but this is inexcusable. Isaiah, it is inexcusable, and that's why you saw the damn break for the Broncos' defense. I mean, allowing Devontae Booker to bust off in the fourth quarter the way he did, that was a defense just saying, look, guys, I give up. Sorry, we can't, we're can't. we not going to come out here and, and take all these fiery darts and play well enough to win only to have you guys just stink it up for an entire 60 minutes. Enough's enough. There is, they are at risk now, Zach, very soon of a mutiny, and I have to wonder – whether or not all this talk we've heard about Drew Locke being the locker room guy and the swagger and being the leader and all that stuff, like it, can that be a difference? Because it seemed like today that that was not, that didn't influence things one yeah. whit. And then to see him kind of joking and stuff and laughing on the sidelines yeah. while they're getting blown out, not good. Not a great look. Yeah. And, and to answer the question, Isaiah, more directly, it, it, we've talked about this ad nauseum, this podcast, but it's both. It is literally both the quarterback and the coaching, but I would even say today, this could prove, guys, how much I'm being honest with you right now. Today, Locke was worse than Pat Shermer. They were both really bad, but Locke was just infinitely more horrible, more inconsistent. That's the bottom line. Uh, Richie says, my question was more about seeing 2021's backup uh, three versus four. Okay, I got you. We did it. We, we did uh, misinterpret. Um we're running out of time though, so I gotta I gotta cruise through here. Whoop, hold up one second and uh, grab these supers, Richie. Love you, bro. And we will. Uh, hold on, sorry, this thing's being. You guys have been so insanely outgoing tonight with all the questions and comments. The chat stream has just been off the hook, and uh, we love you, Dennis Woods. Talk about a superstar and up in Michigan. Love you, buddy. He says, I've been trying to support Locke, but I'm having a hard time continuing with it. Bottom line is simply, we're just not very good right now. That is definitely the bottom line, Zach. They are not a good team. And sometimes the simplest answer and the most basic surface level answer applies. In really getting down to the nitty gritty as we did for the last hour and 24 minutes, we can we can go to the specifics. But the main point, the main takeaway here is all around, it was bad. Uh, from Jay Boss, jumping in. Thank you, Jay. He says, uh, we are like the Lions right now. Ownership is terrible. The GM is leading and doesn't have to report to anyone. There is no accountability at the top. And, you know, that is part of the macro problem. But I really don't think in terms of fixing the situation today that, uh, that if, 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 if you woke up Monday morning and John Elway is fired, does that change the product on the field this year? Like, it doesn't. Right. And that's why I think this year it really is more of a, a result of injuries, poor coaching, and the failure of Locke to take a step forward. Yeah, the Lions and the Broncos, they both have really bad – I wouldn't say bad head coaches for Fangio's sake, but questionable ones, but at least the Lions have a quarterback. I'd take Matt Stafford right now easily. Naj, appreciate you, my friend. He jumps in to say, Locke's decision-making today was stupefying and not NFL caliber. Simmons and Jackson completely underwhelming, agreed. 
And that's another thing is he was Justin Simmons was listed as one of three Broncos all pros at the midseason point by PFF. And I just mm-hmm. don't see that. No. I've seen two or three good games from Simmons, but most of the most of the season he's been the almost version of Justin Simmons, the day late, the dollar short guy. And Jackson to me has been, I mean, outside of his presence in the box, he and maybe that's all you need from your strong safety 90% of the time in coverage. I haven't liked what I've seen from Jackson. And then he says here, Fangio seems disinterested in anything other than calling the next defensive play. Elway, it's time to step down. I mean, in terms of Simmons, I want to talk about this real quick. Did you guys catch the the pass that Henry Ruggs kind of jumped over him for? I mean, Simmons got turned around. He got out jumped by Henry Ruggs. What's that about? And Kareem Jackson, he's okay in run support. He kind of flexes because he has big hits, but he's really underwhelming and below average in coverage. The Broncos' safeties were considered the boon of their defense, but right now they're the impediment of their defense this year. It's crazy how things change. I just don't know what PFF is smoking, seriously. Like, Justin Simmons has not been all pro caliber unless just the safety play across the NFL has not been good. And there, that's not the, the the truth. There have been better performances at the safety position than Justin Simmons in 2020. Brian yeah. Ware says Broncos need to hire Eric B. Enemy. And maybe that's true, but it would take a massive uh, mulligan on Elway's part. And I don't think he's got any mulligans left in the, in the uh, bank, <laughs> as it were. Luke Cooper jumping in to uh, quote you, Zach. Coaching, 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 QB. Coaching. This staff is not performing like the all-stars. They are supposed to be no excuses. Much love from North Carolina. Thank you. Zach. That is so true. I mean, look at this. Vic Fangio is your head coach, a former head coach, an offensive coordinator, former head coach as an O-line uh, coach. Then you've got Mike Shula, who is a former head coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide. There is so much purported coaching wherewithal. Why isn't it coming together for this team? Because it, it, the indisputable fact about it is the players are complicit too. They're not making the plays, and Drew Locke is part of the problem and, and, and the majority of the problem, but the coaching has let them down. And it's just you can have an all-star collection of coaching, Chad, but who cares if it's not the, not the right collection of coaching for your team? Like, remember in 2010, the Eagles put together that dream team with Nam Diasamo and all them and Michael Vick? That didn't turn out. You can assemble star talent, but it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't gel or translate, and it really hasn't. Locke was bad enough, as it turns out, but hiring Shermer to advance that crappiness made it that much worse. Uh, real quick, Greg, he says, Chad, I don't sleep well after losses like this, and I don't even receive a check from the organization. I feel you. It's going to be hard tonight, guys. It's tough, man. This was a this was a sad realization type of day. Uh, but keep your chin up, and we'll see, man. We'll see how it shakes out. And this is our last super, and then we got to dip out for tonight, gang. Uh, Chris Duvall, jumping in. Zach, a name we don't recognize, so thank you and welcome. We need to ride with luck. It's always a we need a, a new QB. We had Osweiler, Lynch, Keenum, Simeon, uh, Flacco, et cetera. This is a young team. Work on uh, – let's see. Work on an offensive coach. And – Although I'm not going to agree with every word there from you, Cristobal, let me just end my portion of this, Zach, by saying, you know, this is really a collective failure. And today Locke was the, uh, you know, he was the linchpin in terms of that failure. But this is an organizational, and I'm talking about the product on the field. There's really not much right now John Elway can do until the season ends. As it stands, this is a Vic Fangio, Pat Shermer, to Mike Shula, to Tom McMahon. Ed Donatel wasn't here today, but that, you could tell he wasn't blame him too. Who cares? We'll throw him in there. Uh, this is from the coaches to the players, 100% just a collective crap show. All right. And it's not acceptable. John Elway, I can promise you is sick to his stomach right now. And uh, you know, Drew Locke, this, the truth is he's more talented. He is a better, more talented player than he sh- he's shown lately. And so that doesn't excuse him, but it does, in my opinion, kind of point to how, you know, the co- this coaching staff has just not been a good fit for him. But what, what can you do to turn it around? What can you do to mitigate what have been Locke's shortcomings up to this point? You know, his, 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 uh, we saw again his drifting backward, especially in the pocket, come back to bite him and haunt him today on two picks. The decision-making, throwing late, not, not seeing free blitzers coming off the edge. You know, these are things that for whatever reason he is not picking up on if, unless he's just really doesn't have a uh, football IQ or acumen, that's a, that's a failure of the coaches to, to help him recognize that. And so I'm kind of rambling here, but at this stage, here's the, here's my last message to you is these coaches still have a chance to make something 
to to make something of the remainder of the season, even if this isn't going to result in the playoffs, and it's probably not, Zach, they have a chance to not only salvage their jobs, but to really save the career of Drew Locke. And and Drew has to be recognized, you know, he needs to recognize that himself at this stage. Like you have now, you went from two weeks ago, uh, I'll say like a third of the fan base jumping off on Drew Locke to last week, you know, maybe a half of Broncos country going, this guy ain't it. Today, Zach, I would say you're probably closer to like 75%. Like what Cristobal's saying here about, you know, I have faith in Locke and all that. That's the minority position now. And Drew Locke has to own up to that and recognize it. It's up to him. It's up to his coaches. We'll see if he can turn it around. Cristobal, five hours ago, and for the last six weeks, I've been right there with you. I've been, you know, banging the table hard for Drew Locke and supporting him and not making excuses, not being an apologist, but kind of pointing out the young reality of, of being a franchise or a potential franchise quarterback in the NFL and the factors he's been dealing with between the pandemic, between the coaching situation, the bad play calling, the injuries, all of that. But I can't look at you in the face right now and say that it's he's not part of the problem, if not the majority of the problem. I'm not off the lock bandwagon, but I, he he lost a lot of the the wind that was in my sails in terms of me supporting him. And everything he did today was in in stark reality and difference and contrast to what I've been advocating for him and saying that he shouldn't do, and he went out there and did. I can't defend him at this point. I can't defend the the footwork, the erraticness. I can't defend the interceptions, his inaccuracy, him not recognizing a free blindside blitzer. I mean, that's Pee Wee Pop Warner stuff. That's all on lock. Am I ready to, you know, execute him, behead him, you know, put him on a spit? No, I'm not ready to jump off the ledge either. I'm not saying he's not the quarterback, but like I think Chad put it perfectly. If you had a little spectrum here, he's way more toward the needle of not being the guy than being in the guy. I think that's a fair assessment for right now. Yeah. And when you're this far into the season, you know, it's pro- the probability is saying if it, when you're that far talking about a needle, like here's the far. Not the guy, here's the far, the guy. And if the needle's pointing that close to being not the guy this far into the season, he's probably not the guy, but there's still a chance, all right? He's still got time. So, And that's what these next seven weeks are going to prove. Vic Fangio isn't yeah. turning away from from uh, Drew Locke in the near future. So we're going to find out. You know, By the time this season's over, I think we're going to have, and that's why they're going to stick with Locke, we're going to know with relative certainty whether or not Drew Locke's the guy. And at this point, it doesn't look good but he's got seven games to turn it around and the coaches as well. But gang, we got to dip out. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. You know, the gut reactions are emotional. They're off the cuff. We're literally, we don't have time to break down the film. We're going off one viewing. We're going off, um, you know, high emotion. And sometimes, you know, when the emotions riding high, you say things and then you calm down and then you look at the numbers, you're able to watch the film and things take on a different perspective and shape and you see more context and there's more nuance. Right now, the takeaway is Drew Locke's got to be better. He was bad today. I mean, bad, bad. He was the reason they lost. And so join us back here tomorrow for the the Aftermath episode, and we'll see what the tonality is. We'll see how it looks uh, tomorrow on Monday as we pick up the pieces. But in the meantime, follow the podcast on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod, and then the main account, at MileHighHuddle. While you're at it on Twitter, follow my partner, Zach Kelberman, at KelbermanNFL, and myself, at Chad and Jensen. And then don't forget as well, our producer, John K at John K M H H on Twitter gang. One last reminder here, go get 20% off and free shipping at manscape.com using the code huddle. Get yourself one of these lawnmower 3.0, get the weed whacker. Even if uh, you know the, the, the ladies in our community, it's a great gift. We've got the holidays coming black Friday and all that. It's a great gift option for that man in your life. Check them out. And then of course, sports betting.com slash mile high huddle, get that free week of sports betting up to a thousand bucks uh, no risk, et cetera, up to a thousand bucks. We love you. We appreciate you. Zach, have a great start to your week, my friend. And, uh, we'll circle, circle back tomorrow night and see where this thing goes from there. Yeah. Broncos country. Let me leave you with this. And to kind of read off of uh, Greg's comment about not uh, losing sleep and not being able to sleep and being sick over this guys perspective wise, it's a game. And these players that you're crying about or losing sleep over, they're not losing sleep over you. They're not crying over you. So you can boil it down to what's going on in the world right now. There's a lot more serious issues. I wouldn't want any Broncos fan to be physically ill over a team when it's a football game. So there's going to be better times ahead. It's going to be a rocky process, but just hang in there and always keep your chin up and be positive. All right, guys. Uh, Guys. Uh, couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, John. To all of you, we love you. We appreciate you. Keep your chin up, okay? Let's have a great week, and uh, we'll shake this one off tomorrow. But hopefully yeah. we helped you exercise some demons here. 
but we got a dip. We went really long because you guys are just phenomenal and had a lot to say tonight. And we're here to help you understand it, help you break it down and understand it ourselves. So thanks for, for being here with us. My high salute to our super chat superstars. We love you guys. And we'll see you tomorrow night for Zach Kelberman. I'm Chad Jensen. We'll see you then. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.